refer to the experts who will present their cases today. They are from Vienna University College of Teacher Education, Australia, University of Malaya, Malaysia, and Stellenbosch University, South Africa. For the second half of the session, those who are interested will have the chance to discuss in groups the challenges and good practices in relation to our shift to online teaching and learning. I'm confident that we will all learn from each other. Thank you everyone for being with us. We are now present to you Barry Stoppa, Senior Program Manager, Development Cooperation, Partnership Programs, Alumni Projects, Higher Education Management, German Academy Action Service, DAAD, Germany, for her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Thank you. Yeah, and good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone from the DAD's office in Bonn. Good day, uh, says it best, I think. Um, it's a good morning here in Bonn. Um, and yeah, let me from DAD sites, uh, the German Academic Exchange Service, and also in the name of all ASEAN QA partners, um, yeah, wish you a very warm welcome to today's uh, conference and um, yeah, specifically to all distinguished speakers, to all you participants out there and our regional partners. We are very glad to meet today in this forum and specifically on uh, today's topic for this uh, conference. The ASEAN QA project that ended last year looks back on several years of dialogue and training activities with higher education institutions in the frame of the contribution to establish comparable regional and international standards and QA systems in higher education and the increase of mobility and network in the Southeast Asian region was an important goal and the establishment of the ASEAN QA Association um, marks or marked a great starting point for the future of the enhancement of regional higher education. And we are very much looking forward to this today's conference organized um, by the association and um, very much also looking forward to future, fruitful future activities. And let me just shortly mention two projects um, that are ongoing in the region since um, uh, they are relevant for all participants and also speakers and partners today. Most of you may know the EU-funded uh, higher education support project uh, SHARE that um, will hopefully soon uh, continue with another two years um, of running time. Information will, of course, be shared of, um, of those who are involved uh, of the whole consortium. And um, I would like to specifically mention one ongoing call for the DS training course on internal quality assurance, train IQA, organized by the University of Potsdam. Um, that call, um, the course will start in September and targets uh, QA officers in higher education institutions. And yeah, the call is still ongoing. Um, deadline is uh, 2nd, no, 3rd August. So, um, I'm sure if you have not come across the call um, and the link how to apply or to spread the link further onwards, we will be happy uh, to share the link here as well. But for now, let me say thank you to the organizers for this workshop, for the um, conference and the workshops today. Um, we are very happy to be part and looking forward uh, to very fruitful discussions, uh, great conference and uh, intensive workshops. So wish you all a very great conference and yeah, looking forward to what comes next. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a welcome. I'm now handing over then to um, Barbara Michalk for the first session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Beirut, and, uh, and a very good afternoon and a good morning to everybody from Germany here. A very warm welcome on behalf of the German Rectors Conference, HRK, which is the association of universities, universities of applied sciences, colleges of art and music, 
that hosts the DS program together with BID. I am Barbara Mischalk, head of the section Higher Education in Germany and Europe, and I have the honor of guiding you through this part of the forum. I'm very impressed by the number of participants we have here in our online forum, and I would like to thank the organizers for the excellent preparation, and I'd like to thank you for logging in to our conference. Let me now shortly introduce the panel we have here. It is a truly global meeting, inviting experts from Europe, Southeast Asia, and South Africa. From left to right, you can see on the banner, Professor Klaus Hintzel Gutermann, the head of the Center for Educational Technology and Innovation and coordinator of the Department of Interdisciplinary Education at Vienna College of Teacher Education, Austria. Next one is his colleague, Thomas Strasser, Professor of Language Methodology and Technology Enhanced Learning at Vienna University College of Teacher Education. Then you can see Associate Professor Kieran Kawa, Director of the Quality Management and Enhancement Center, Professor at the Department of Library and Information Science and Faculty of Computer Science and Information Technology, University of Malaya in Malaysia. And last, but certainly not least, Milita Clerk, Hybrid Learning Project Manager and Project Lead for the Strategic Management of Hybrid and Online Programs at Stellenbosch University, South Africa. Welcome to you. We have organized this session as follows. Firstly, we will listen to the experts' presentation and we will take questions for clarification only after the presentation and then we will proceed to the next expert. We will have an overall question and answer session on the content of the three presentations together after they have all had their say. You can hand in your questions in writing using the Q&A tool on your screen. So now let's go to the first presenters and uh, the two colleagues from the University College for for teacher education in Vienna will present together. Klaus Hintzel Gutermann is the head of the Center for Education, Technology and Innovation and coordinator of the Department for Interdisciplinary Education. He completed a master's degree in educational technology at the New University in Krems, where he worked in the Department of Interactive Media and Educational Technology. His main focus of research is the electronic portfolio in both research and teaching. He completed his interdisciplinary PhD in philosophy in the field of lifelong learning at Alpen Adria University in Klagenfurt, and he has been involved in three EU-wide projects on portfolios. He is presenting together with Thomas Strasser, who is a professor of language methodology and technology enhanced learning and teaching at the Vienna University College of Teacher Education. Apart from that, he is a language teacher, teacher educator, author, and international speaker. Thomas is an international reviewer for the European Commission and many academic journals. He is an academic counselor for various international universities and the Goethe Institute, especially in the field of language learning and digital technologies. His publications include practical resource books on internet tools and activities to engage students and over 40 publications. Klaus and Thomas, they will present together and the floor is yours, you can start. There you go. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, for the introduction and the invitation. We're really looking forward to giving you a brief overview uh, concerning the shift of going digital in our institution. So 
First of all, the current uh, pandemic situation in Austria is the following. There has been a complete lockdown of universities since March 2020. So, which actually means that there is no face-to-face -face interaction between professors and um, uh, student teachers seen from a, a continuous lesson point of view. And of course, uh, this means that there is a certain forced shift of paradigmatic and performative mindsets among lecturers. And this is, of course, an extremely important and relevant question when it comes to quality assurance in hybrid or blended learning situations. Our university college has about 3,000 students, mainly in the field of pre-service teacher education, in the field of primary education and secondary education. And our focal areas are pre-service and in-service teacher education, and of course, the relevant research and development, especially in the context of lifelong professionalization of teachers. Uh, we won't provide a solid overview of our university college, but what we would like to emphasize is our practical and scientific focal points, which means that our institution has eight centers with different specialities. That means Klaus and I work for the Center for Educational Technology and Innovation, which is more or less a dynamic ubiquitous hub that deals with various tendencies and curricular developments concerning the digitization within educational fields. And that's why I would like to hand over to Klaus in order to more or less illustrate the tasks of this center, please. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, our motto in the end of February and in the beginning of March was keep the distance learning concept short and simple. Thomas, next slide, please. So KISS distance learning. <laughs> And our concept consisted of three pillars. The first one and very important for the communication with the student groups was using the email from our central administration system of the university. For example, for announcements or for um, applying for assessments and so on. The second very important pillar and used at our university for about 15 years now is the learning management system Moodle for asynchronous e-learning. And the third pillar and mostly new for most of our teachers, the video conferencing platform Zoom for synchronous sessions. So the package of our lockdown measures in March uh, again consisted of three pillars. The first one was daily online seminars on the use of Zoom and Moodle. Also an online repository with instructions and tutorials uh, as PDF and video. And we had two different support hotlines. One rather technical, one didactic, via phone, email, and Zoom, where the colleagues could ask questions. Uh, later on, after the first uh, few weeks, uh, the seminars were converted into online consultation hours in which teachers could get advice on mainly didactic questions. The effort for the support team was very high in the beginning, but later on it was remarkably low. Although, for example, the number of Zoom accounts of teachers increased from 10 at the beginning to 350 at the end so that we can assume that our support package was well received. 
for online lessons with Zoom, we suggested three scenarios. The first one in German is called Vorlesung. That means an online lecture with presentation by the teacher, usually supported by a set of slides via screen sharing, like now at the moment, and the possibility for students to ask questions via chat or audio, or discuss individual aspects of the lecture. Usually we have more than 50 participants there, up to 200, and it is from 45 to 90 minutes. The second scenario is called seminar, only a very short presentation at the beginning, afterwards then more interaction, prepared task for groups of students, which can be realized very well in Zoom via breakout sessions. We have short presentation of the results in plenum at the end of the session or at the beginning of the next meeting. Usually we have less than 50 participants and 60 to 120 minutes. And the third scenario is called Übung, exercise. Uh, the students receive work assignments alone or in small groups at the previous meeting and prepare presentations for the others, followed by feedback and discussion. Usually less than 25 participants, 60 to 120 minutes. The graph on the right shows how the activity is distributed between teachers and students in the three scenarios. Student activity is low in lectures and high in exercises, while teacher activity decreases from lecture to exercise. To keep the simple concept, we again also agreed in assessment questions on three variants. First one is oral exams via Zoom. The second one are interactive tests from home as multiple choice or on open questions via Moodle. And the third one are other assignments, different tasks that had to be completed via Moodle by a given time. The first two variants are synchronous exams. The third is asynchronous. Difficult questions arose here, especially with the number two. For example, how do you establish the identity of the candidate? How do you prevent the use of unauthorized aids and unlawful agreements between the candidates? How much time is appropriate for how many questions? What is the difficulty of the questions? If they are mostly too easy, this leads to copy and paste answers from the internet. If they are too difficult, problems arise for the weaker students. So it is much more difficult to obtain a normal distribution of achievements than with analogous examinations in the lecture hall. So how did we proceed? We offered trainings for teachers to formulate good exam questions along the taxonomy of Bloom. We offered also support for details in the test settings of Moodle. We provided a large pool of questions with a random selection of questions from three different levels of difficulty in a random order, no navigation between questions is allowed and we have a relatively high time pressure. We decided to have no identification of more than 10 candidates via Zoom or other measures. And uh, we decided to let them sign a declaration that they will take the exam themselves alone and only with the permitted aids. 
We also did additional random checks or in case of urgent suspicion, checks with the aid of plagiarism scan software and if necessary, an additional oral examination. So Klaus was rather talking about the systemic implementation processes of such distance learning scenarios. I would like to talk about the performative shift towards distance learning in the lockdown. And that's why we considered a learning management system uh, as Moodle, like Moodle, as a so-called dynamic and ubiquitous catalyst to provide curricular artifacts, because that's the main task in times of distance learning. That means our institution uses the learning management system Moodle as a modular object oriented dynamic learning environment. So that's why we would like to provide good practice examples here, what we understand how we could provide curricular implementation within distance learning scenarios. And this is a best practice uh, example from one of my learning management systems. And I cannot go into a didactic pattern taxonomy of learning management systems here, but what we believe is vital for coherent and sustainable distance learning scenarios are structure, iconographic navigation and constant interaction. So for us, learning management systems need to be structures full of interaction between students and teachers. So here, the student has a clear structure, which means um, every single curricular unit is divided into sections with the so called basics. That means these are the curricular artifacts that are obligatory. And then they have a section for additional input, which means for those students who would like to specialize in a certain curricular field and a section with academic backup. Uh, which is the last section, because for us, it's very important that always come up with scientific and uh, scientific cross references when doing curricular artifacts. So furthermore, the lecturer is constantly interacting with the student on asynchronous and synchronous channels, because a lot of studies tell us that students complain the lacking of interaction with the students. And that's why we try to interact with students in forums, but also with videos, as you can see here, that the lecturer uh, produces his own videos in order to give them some interactional proximity as one vital part of systemic implementation of distance learning scenarios. And before we come to an end, I would like to refer to scientific uh, references more or less here, because seen from a quality assurance point of view, we immediately linked approaches from research concerning blended and distance learning uh, scenarios and quality insurance was very important for us also with practical design of the courses, which means that all of our courses had clear uh, post-session evaluative feedback sessions with rubrics, what uh, the students liked about the course and not. And we followed certain state-of-the-art didactic principles like taxonomies by Gagné and emphasized the discursive presence of the lecturer. And in order to disseminate didactic and systemic implementation expertise among all the lecturers and professors in the house, we are considering support systems like online facilitator certificates as one QA USP scenarios. That means we would like to offer in-house training sessions concerning the design of distance learning scenarios. And uh, one other thing would be that another vital approach concerning high standards distance learning scenarios is the implementation of so-called universal interface design principles. That means the skills of to design accessible and digitally inclusive learning environments, which is one another um, QA USP for our hybrid and distance learning scenarios. And one last point, we also have to focus on the learner's perspective. 
And that's why it's extremely important also uh, to uh, reactivate Keller's ARCS model, which grounds on fundamental aspects of motivation within learning processes. So one quantitative criteria of solid coherent learning processes is motivation. And so for us, one of the most important aspects in distance learning is motivation. And in order to avoid monotonous, let's say, death by PowerPoint PDF avalanches within a learning uh, environment, uh, didactic design is of great uh, importance. And this needs to be varied with a clear anticipated curricular focus using uh, media learners are used to uh, always emphasize the learning pro progress and showing curricular achievements with badges or rubrics or so-called uh, in, uh, incentives, which are relevant for extrinsic rewards. So on the whole, we truly believe in a holistic didactic approach that encompasses more or less didactic uh, coherence with state of the art uh, quality assurance standards or considerations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas and Klaus, for your very relevant and uh, comprehensive presentation. And I have here a question from the audience, which uh, is relevant for all of the universities offering not only online teaching and learning, but also assessment. And the question is, how do you ensure reliability, validity, and fairness of every pillar of the assessment? Um, I, I will start, and Thomas, you can, you can follow up if you want. Um, it is clear that uh, especially the second one of our three pillars, the uh, Moodle tests from home, uh, are only a solution for now, for the period uh, uh, with COVID-19. And we hope that um, soon, maybe in half a year or in a year, um, we don't need uh, this, this assessment anymore. So it, it is really very difficult, um, for example, to have the fairness. Um, and we have people who uh, have disabilities or have uh, difficulties uh, with, with the language. They, of course, need more time uh, to read a certain task. And we have the same time for, for all uh, candidates, for example. Um, we try to have a really high level of uh, fairness and for example, the, the um, random uh, selection of the questions is one that is very important for that. So we have three different levels and every student gets questions from the three different uh, difficulty levels. Of course, also the question that they um, do it alone and have uh, no, no help from, from other people is, is really difficult when you have um, a big amount of um, exams. For example, we have 120 for, for a lecture, then you can't control them with uh, webcams or with, with other measures. So for us, this is only for now a solution uh, to provide different exams. Yes, and concerning fairness, uh, we have to differentiate between a uh, technologically determined fairness, as Klaus said, so that algorithms work fine with randomization of questions. But we also speak of a so-called curricular interactional fairness. That means our content, uh, the, uh, uh, the content relevant for the exams, needs to be clearly communicated and anticipated. And that's why it's so extremely important for us that the lecturers really try to interact with the students, also try trying to deal with the certain things to be covered and tested at the assessment. So it's a mixture of technological and pedagogical um, considerations concerning the uh, definition of fairness within assessments. Okay, thanks for that 
clarification and we will have time enough just to take another very practical question here concerning assessments. You have mentioned that uh, your idea of education covers not only the cognitive issues, but also others. And if there are practical courses like uh, laboratories in chemistry or physics, how do you handle assessment of those, uh, um, those activities? How do you assess people who work in laboratory if you cannot be in, in the setting of that case? Well, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in the uh, chemical lab, but we do have future learning labs. We do have really very dynamic labs where students are supposed to work. But how do we guarantee that? Now, there are various ways where actually what we let students do is we let them produce certain artifacts which are possible at home because we're well aware of the fact that they're not equipped like a lab. So that's why we can only come up with very reduced not really uh, authentic lab situations. And we let students produce videos about the processes and the performance. So we do not really focus on the technical equipments and the use of various ingredients as an outcome. We rather focus on the learning process and the documentation about the uh, success stories and failure. I'm well aware of the fact that this is not a satisfying answer concerning lab equipment, but here there's a certain shift away from classic technologically determined use of various technical ingredients rather than on how students work, reflect and interact about their learning process. That might sound a bit spiritual, but that is our experience concerning how we could definitely uh, probably also give away grades and marks for the labs. We call the we have the same situation in so-called school practical studies, where actually our students, the teachers are supposed to go into schools, which they're actually not allowed to. So that's why we have to come up with various situations, dilemma situations, and really focus on the discursive, reflective skills of the students. Thanks for that. I guess this means that you're moving towards a kind of assessment in portfolios rather than definitely in yes. situations. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sorry to say that all the other questions that have run up until now will need to be tackled later because we have to move on to the next presenters. Thanks to you, first sure. of all. And now I'd like to invite Professor Kiran Kaur to speak to us. She is the Director of Quality Management and Enhancement Center at the University of Malaya in Malaysia. The office is responsible for the accreditation and quality assurance of all levels of academic programs in the university. Dr. Kiran is an associate professor at the Department of Science, Faculty of Computer Science and Information Technology. She holds a master's in library and information science and a PhD. Her research interests include information services, service quality, quality management, librarianship, social networking, community information services, and to metrics. So Kiran, I hope everything is ready for your presentation because now the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Barbara, for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And also good morning, I think, to some of you. And uh, let me just share my slides with you. Okay, I hope this is visible. All right, uh, my name is Kieran. I'm from the uh, Quality Management and Enhancement Center today. I am representing that center uh, to present to you the second case, the case of University of Malaya. And my presentation content is similar to the previous presentation, a little bit on the uh, COVID pandemic situation in Malaysia and University of Malaya and how we UM shifted to the online teaching and learning. Now, this is a, a little overview of the pandemic situation in our country. Here is Malaysia, just next to Singapore. And uh, overall, we have about a population of 32 million people. And up to 21st of June, we have had about 8,800 cases. And sadly, we have lost 123 people to this pandemic. But as you can see in the graph, uh, it is improving. The situation in June is slightly improving. And our movement control order, if you have a look at that, 
It is, sorry. Uh, we began a total lockdown on the 18th of March. Everything was at a standstill. Clo schools were closed, universities were closed, businesses were closed. And we've had a gradually opening up in phase two, three, four, five. And now currently we are in phase six where we consider it as a recovery movement control order. And I also would like to bring to your attention that the internet penetration of uh, Malaysia is at 81.4. Yeah? As for University of Malaya, uh, very briefly, we are the oldest university in Malaysia. Uh, currently, we are at, uh, we have achieved a ranking of 59 for the QS uh, University, World University ranking and at number 13 in the QS University ranking. Uh, we are proud to have almost 26,000 students in campus of which uh, about 16,000 are undergraduates, about more than 10,000 postgraduates, and uh, of which 3,500 are international students from about 90 over countries. We are dealing with about 200 over academic programs. And um, we actually, for 2020 to 2021, we were going to embrace a future ready curriculum framework. We had several transformation initiatives uh, made ready, planned, and slight disruption because of this pandemic, but we are still working towards achieving these initiatives. Um, and overall of our IQ, on the quality, I'd like to introduce that in UM, we have under the device de chancellor, we have a unit, uh, sorry, we have a center, the quality management enhancement center, which basically takes care of, uh, we have sort of two arms. Yeah? We started off with the uh, quality management system in University of Malaya way back in 2002, based on the ISO 9001. So because of this, we cover actually a lot of the core processes in the university and we have what we call as quality committees at every uh, non-academic and academic entities. So we have a number of quality managers, auditors, document controllers and the other arm is the academic program quality assurance uh, where we have the accreditation of academic programs being carried out and reassessment of accredited programs. And we have trained program uh, quality assurance experts and we have trained program assessors. So if you look at these little icons here, I'm just trying to stress that throughout the university, we have trained um, many people and the whole a big community of the university is well trained and we mobilize this community to work with us in the quality assurance of academic programs and of all the support program, support services. Now, as for shift to the online teaching and learning, when the pandemic uh, early in January to February, where there was already an increased awareness of the spread of this virus, and uh, we began to plan on uh, give announcements about the virus, about safety measures, the emphasis was that, yeah, how to prevent and how to detect the symptoms and prepare for this uh, facing 20. 19 and COVE at that time it was called. And we also in early February uh, realized that we will have to move on to online learning because of this pandemic. So what happened after that, as in March, things became more serious, there was a national lockdown on the 18th of March. So that caused our original semester to shift tremendously. Yeah, we have a semester two was going on. Uh, it is supposed to last for a duration of 17 weeks, of which we could only do four weeks of conventional teaching learning as what was planned. So we immediately had the students resume teaching and learning fully online by 27th of April. So within these five weeks, we had to immediately take action. And at that time, because uh, I'm only going to talk about the teaching learning, so the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International uh, is in charge of that. And there are several entities under her portfolio, the Academic Administration and Service Center, the Strategic Planning Center, the Academic Enhancement Leadership Development Center, and Internship Training and Academic Enrichment Center. So all of us had to come together and work out what we are going to do in 
moving the teaching learning from our con conventional methods to the online method. And uh, QMAC's role at that time, our Quality Management Enhancement Center, was to look at what the National Qualification Agency had to say. Yeah, so the Malaysian Qualification Agency was very helpful in this whole shift as they came up with several advisory notes, uh, giving us guidelines on how to deliver this higher education program during and also post COVID-19 movement order. Okay. So what prepared us, basically what I would like to share here is the situation in UM, because we have a quality management system, our procedures, SOPs were in place and people are competent in documentation. We, have, we know that about UM and um, the Malaysian Qualification Agency at the same time, their advisory notes and their guidelines played a huge had a huge impact on how we handled the situation. And we had our internal quality management system had us established centers for academic monitoring, the ones that I showed in the earlier slide. And luckily enough, in March 2017, we had a business continuity management uh, mechanism put in place where at that time, uh, we already initiated e-learning at least once a week for every course, uh, gradually every course, uh, every program in the university in case of there's a major event, a major disaster. So lecturers, uh, teaching staff and students who are somewhat familiar with a sudden change to an e-learning uh, environment. And we also had quality managers at every academic and non-academic entities and academic program quality assurance expert. So the synergy was there. We had a, a system in place where everyone was used to working together. All right. So challenges faced, of course, immediately were the uncertainties. Students were uncertain, lecturers were uncertain. What is going to happen if when the shutdown happened and everyone is back at their homes and so the social proximity is not there anymore. Some of our students, they, they were located in very remote areas, there's no internet access. We knew that there are going to be major changes in certain processes and procedures on how we do things, uh, teaching methodologies, learning methodologies for the student, assessment, all of this was suddenly, a lot of it had to be given to the students and also to the lecturers and especially competencies of lecturers in content development, all right? And for students also on using these online meeting tools, e-learning platforms. They were only so far familiar with our uh, learning management system that we use in the university that is based on Moodle. And there was a big demand on IT staff also because of infrastructure and accessibility issues. So with all these demands, we were at, for quality assurance of the academic program, our main concern was the learning outcomes. How do we handle this so that the learning outcome of the student for that particular semester is not compromised? So um, we began with, uh, between March to June, we begin with a lot of guidelines, yeah. Okay, that five week break we had, and even when uh, start classes commenced online, we continued with the certain guidelines, right, from teaching learning from, to industrial training to online final examination and postgraduate standard, uh, candidate standard operating procedures for using laboratories, using studios. And the one um, interesting one that we finally managed to do was the UM Teach Online. This was a portal uh, developed by the Academic Development Center where all the teaching guides, as we had done many webinars and training, were all put in one portal and people were able to share their thoughts and share their practices. Besides that, uh, to support that, uh, ICT support, uh, we had guidelines to supplementary tools, not only rely on our e-learning system, which is already established, we had data plan packages for students who did not have data back home and at home supports uh, also for students with free data given to students during this time. And uh, another important thing to assure the quality was getting feedback. As we made decisions and we changed processes to suit the online environment, it was very important to get student feedback. So beginning with the use of uh, usage of e-learning from staff and student, we asked them about 
right? This was right at the beginning, yeah? about their access and the tools that they have, the access that they have. And then we wanted to change our grading system, whether they want to use the current system or change to pass or fail. Again, we did a survey and we got feedback from the students as to what they would like the university to do. And as the courses were being conducted online, uh, students were now filling up uh, feedback on the online courses. And we just finished our semester early this month on the 12th of June. So now we are conducting an online learning student experience survey. This covers all the programs that were offered in the previous semester one. So this feedback is very important to us for making decisions for the coming semesters. And this is, an ex this is a description of the online teaching learning guideline that we had to, we came up with. Basically, in this guideline, we told them how to calculate the student learning time because the activities are now online. And a lot of uh, emphasis was given on assessment because this was one of the uncertainties that students and lecturers talked about. They are not sure how to go ahead about this especially when there was no more face-to-face -face examination. Uh, they were advised by the Malaysian Qualification Agency, all right? And uh, they were advised to have alternative assessment for final exam. So these alternative assessments, uh, we made sure that they were valid and reliable. So there was vetting done towards uh, these assessments. There was check and checking done and then the conduct of the assessment, how to deter cheating, how to encrypt a document, all of this was underlined in the uh, guidelines, all right? And uh, our center, the Quality Management and Enhancement Center, we worked together in, with this guideline so that we, our, our main task was to see that the quality indicators were complied with. For example, documents complied to the Ministry and National Qualification Agency's requirements all the changes that were made now to online and especially assessment were to be documented and informed to the students. And all of this has to be made available on the learning management system, materials to be vetted and validated and no compromise of the student learning outcomes. So we, we need to monitor the online teaching. This was done at the uh, specific uh, faculties or centers itself. Currently, we are conducting, we will be conducting in August an internal audit to check on the compliance of the SOPs that we had in place. And we are also looking into the feedback mechanism to enhance uh, teaching and learning activities. This is an example of the uh, portal that I said just now about the UM Teach Online. So this is by the Academic Development Enhancement Center, Leadership Enhancement Center, where they post all the online videos on how you can shift to online teaching, uh, documentation in terms of guidelines. And they also had a series of webinars, many, many webinars almost every day for to train the staff on how to move towards this online teaching. Okay. So basically lessons learned here. Um, one, we found that our business continuity management mechanism really worked. It prepared us for this sudden change. Our internal IQ, QA system being established, we had roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, and immediately we could re realign our processes. Uh, students and lecturers feedback was very important to this change in this teaching learning and we're also collecting feedback at the end of the semester so that we can make some enhancements in the coming semester. The IQ information management, yes, uh, this is very important. Data, decisions had to be made based on data. So we collected data, analyzed it and reporting it to aid our decision making. We did not experience any external assessment during this period, but uh, we have we are going to be doing an internal assessment, which will be done remotely. This is also a new experience to us. We have not done a remote audit before, and also a full accreditation of one of the programs. It will be, is due in August. Again, we are going to try to be doing this uh, remotely, and. Uh, a lot of consideration is currently being given to micro-credentials yeah, to support professional, academic, and personal development. Because once you are online, you are giving an opportunity for students to uh, do their, the, teach, the learning through micro-credentials. And uh, most important is communication. Yeah. 
because when you have a big change like that and a lot of uncertainties, the best way to succeed is to communicate to people what is happening and what the university is planning to do. And over time, as you are monitoring them, they are aware of this monitoring. All right. And what we can move, uh, we can further improve on is on the impact of isolation on the students' well-being. Yeah, we will increase our efforts to address uh, this issue in the coming semester, which is again going to be uh, fully online. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, that is what uh, you, I can share with you for now as to what uh, University of Malaya is, um, has been doing to overcome this pandemic. Thank you. A big thank you to you, Kiran, for sharing your experience with your own university. And there are questions coming in to you specially. Uh, I think it was good that you covered the question of assessment so extensively because that has been recurring in the questions of the participants. Mm -hmm. But there is one thing I would like to pick out here, and that is what were the most urgent things you had to put in place for the shift to online teaching and learning? Okay, most urgent would be uh, training the academic staff. Because as the, the classes were put online, it, before this, because in University of Malaya, we do not have distance learning programs. So we carry out our programs in the conventional method. And uh, so many of the lecturers were only used to using e-learning within one week of the semester. All right. So that was our first challenge. Second was getting students the data access because many of the students did report in our first survey that they did not have access to data and immediately we had to take action on that. Yes. Could you be a bit more explicit about the action you took to make the students able to access all the information you, were, you wanted to provide to them? The students were able to access our e-learning uh, system, which is Spectrum. We call it Spectrum. It's based on Moodle. So announcements were being made on that e-learning system so students could access. Uh, teaching materials were being uploaded. At the same time, uh, we worked with some of the telecommunication uh, companies who provided uh, additional data to our students. So we did a survey and we looked, we saw, uh, we sort of uh, narrowed down to students who actually needed this data and they were provided with us that data so that they could access. So I think that's a very important point you made there because that was among the questions too, if there were special packages for the students so that it was easier for them to download all yes. the things you had on your platform. Yes. And last but not least, I think we have just time for one question to you. And that is, how did you motivate the students for the online sessions? You mentioned that it's a, it's a lonesome business sitting in front of your screen and doing your work. Were there extra motivations you could offer? Okay. Um, I think in terms of motivation, it will go back to the individual uh, lecturers. So far, we are just conducting the survey and we have not got back the results. Once we have the results, we will get the feedback from the student. But from so far, uh, from what I do know, the feedback that we have received is in terms of, as I said just now, reducing the uncertainties. If the student, we gave the student all the information, we have a website on which the student can access the academic calendar as it was uh, changed, it was given to the students so that they know now this is the shift of the classes and this is how the class is going to be conducted. So they had to be clearly, we had clearly asked lecturers to document. So as your lecture changes from a face-to-face to non-face-to-face, -to, -face, the documentation included uh, specifying whether you are going to upload your lectures, are you going to go online face to face, or is it uh, synchronous, asynchronous, and assessments were changed because earlier continuous assessment might be only three, but when you have your exam being converted to assessment, it will get more than three, probably four or five. So all this information was given to the student. So in a way, I, to me, I feel the student is motivated as you 
tell the student, look, this is the new schedule. This is what's going to happen for the, from week six to week 14. And you do not have a face-to-face -face exam, be prepared for additional work. So the student knows and the decision made at that time for the university, the students' feedback and lecturers' feedback, we did not change our grading system. But students were allowed to apply for a grade, which was I, and in case that they cannot cope. So otherwise, yeah, that's what we did. Keep them informed so they knew throughout the semester what is expected of them. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Kiran, and we will get back to you in the final round of questions and answers right. after our last presentation. And the last presentation in this round is going to be by Ms. Millie de Clerc, and she is the Hybrid Learning Project Manager at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. She is responsible for the strategic management of the university's expanding portfolio of hybrid and online programs for adult learners. Mine holds a master's degree in business administration. As a PhD candidate, she is at this time researching traditional universities shift to online teaching and learning. And I think the COVID crisis has provided her with lots of case studies for that. Her research includes the facilitation of theology, engagement in the virtual classroom. She is also interested in the potential for higher education institutions from emerging market and developing countries to shape our shared understanding of how online learning can be better designed for local context while it remains responsive to the global challenges. Mine, the floor is yours now and you can start with your presentation. We are looking forward Thank to you. Thank you. All right. Let me just share that quickly. See if you can all see that. Um, well, uh, the chair, please just let me know verbally if you can see my screen. Yes, it can be perfectly seen. Thank you so much, Frank. Okay, um, thank you colleagues for this opportunity to chat with you and thank you also especially to my co-presenters. It certainly does seem that we have a, um, a shared understanding uh, of these difficult issues, um, but it's wonderful to hear from different parts of the world. Now, the part of the world that I'm uh, chatting to you from is the southern tip of Africa. Uh, Stellenbosch University is about a 30-minute drive from um, Cape Town. You can see a picture of our university campus there. And I'm going to sketch um, a bit of background on our university, then I'll shift to emergency remote teaching through the lens of quality assurance at our university. And I'll say something about my own role and what hybrid learning really means at the university as well, because this is quite an integral part of our shift to ERT or emergency remote teaching. So let's keep on going. There we go. So Stellenbosch University, a few facts. We have about 30,000 students, um, some of them also from foreign countries, but a smaller portion, uh, about 3,000 permanent staff members, of which a third are academics. We don't have just this one main campus in the Winelands that you can see, but also about a 30 minute drive to Cape Town. You'll find our medical, medical campus there, as well as our business school. And we're the only South African university with a military campus on the West Coast of South Africa. We're a very research intensive university, a high ranking one. Um, and we're also a very traditional university, a contact university. And I'd like to stop there for a moment and chat about what this contact notion really means. So if you look at the mode of delivery at um, Stellenbosch University, on the right hand side of the screen, you have our mostly online offerings. And these are um, everything that's not credit bearing, not academic credit bearing. So bearing a certificate of completion or competency or fully online short courses. We've offered MOOCs or massive open online courses in partnership with FutureLearn. Um, and for these, no minimum co contact time is required. So it can be fully online. 
But if you look at our mostly contact or face-to-face -face offering, these are our academic credit-bearing courses. There we have to have uh, get subsidy from the state as a face-to-face uh, -face university or contact university, at least um, it's about 30 to 45% of our undergraduate programs need to be delivered in a face-to-face -face way or a contact way. So about a third of the, at least a third of the notional hours. So uh, in our case, contact can also be synchronous. Anything like we're doing now, which is real-time engagement, that is also seen as contact. Um, so for us, this has never been a problem. We have our lovely campuses, but we soon realized in order to be responsive to the new world of work, the changing need of graduates, we also need to look into hybrid learning. Now we, um, I know the terms hybrid and blended is used in interchangeably in the literature, but we um, see hybrid learning as a new strategic initiative where we focus on intense block mode learning. So the student would come to campus for about a week or two weeks, and then they, if they're a working student or they cannot afford living on a very expensive campus all the time, they can go off, go home or to their place of work, and then they learn in a predominantly fully online way, um, let's say for a couple of months, perhaps with a few weeks webinars in between, and then they will have um, come back to campus for another block of, let's say, lab work or other interactive um, contact time. So that's kind of blocked focus mode learning. And that means you really have to up your game in terms of online learning, because there's such sustained periods of fully online learning. Now, this has already been a priority of the university before lockdown and the whole COVID pandem pandemic period. And it's quite essential for us because it laid the foundation of our understanding of online learning in multiple ways. So you can see an article that was launched uh, recently as hybrid learning, the next wave to it, Stellenbosch University. And we've been um, testing hybrid learning and putting some of our modules fully online uh, if the rest of the program has enough contact time and uh, refining our online teaching and learning practice just before uh, the pandemic period. So before I start focusing on what happened during uh, the, the pandemic period, I'd like to uh, just give you an idea of quality assurance at Stellenbosch University. Now I'm part of the um, Division for Learning and Teaching Enhancement. I'm not at the, our Quality Assurance Center, but I work very closely with them. So quickly, our theoretical framework and our policy is that we take a developmental approach to QA. We see ourselves as a learning organization in our strategic framework. Um, and we subscribe to QA based on the conceptualization uh, by Marshall. And I can share that resource with you as um, a process of collective sense making and reflection and that it makes provision for the complex and dynamic nature of higher education institutions in contemporary society. And when it comes to complexity, uh, the South African higher institution landscape is definitely a complex one. As you probably know, we have a very prob problematic political history. Uh, we have had to um, really change our approach to access and equity um, and a cohesive society. So uh, complexity and change is something that we're quite versed in dealing with. So um, to frame my presentation, I'm going to look at our, how we make sense of quality assurance at our university. And in our policy, it states that QA as sense making um, is influenced by three factors. Firstly, the context of the, the university, the wider landscape, political, social, political, in which the institution is situated, but also the institutional context itself. Uh, people, if we say people, we can always also say processes because roles and responsibilities go together, but really the, 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 the roles and um, tasks of our stakeholders. And then always acknowledging that each, we're always navigating change, but each change is different. So how we respond in terms of assuring quality will also have to adapt accordingly. So let's start with the notion of context. So what was our context when we had to shift to emergency remote teaching? A quick timeline, about um, the first week of March, we were already called into meetings, um, all the support staff and those working online and, and, and blended learning about the, the idea that perhaps 
it was very far off the idea at that time. I think we had um, less than 10 cases in South Africa and already we were hearing that there's there might be the option that we'll have to suspend um, on-campus activity. And surely a couple of days late later, all our lectures were suspended. And then our President Cyril Ramaphosa announced our lockdown period only a few days thereafter. So things had escalated very, very quickly. And this was amidst our th first term. So only two days later, we already launched our uh, lecture support site for emergency remote teaching on Moodle. Uh, we had we launched a preparing for online teaching webinar. I presented that first one with a colleague of mine, and we already appointed new interim support staff for very faculty based support. So you can see our response was immensely quick, most likely because um, we we have a very responsive culture at our university. Also, at the same time, we had a business continuity continuity subcommittee for teaching and learning. I'm, I'm part of that subcommittee. And that's a very wide multi-stakeholder approach. And I'll say something about how essential that was a bit later. And then quickly thereafter, a lot of you asked questions about assessment. And we realized a very strong focus on online assessment would be key. So we let, launched a parallel webinar series for our lecturers specifically about assessment. Um, shortly thereafter, a completely new academic calendar for the year was shared and where we would have started um, in mid to late March with our next term that was extended to 20th of April. And at the moment, we are continuing learning about the process, but we've actually had a quite successful first and second term of fully online learning, obviously with loads of challenges, um, but we are quite, um, I think, uh, all still surprised about how well I think we handled it so far. So um, getting continuing on this notion of context. So this is what happened at Stellenbosch University. What did we have in place immediately when this sudden shift happened? So the first key um, form of infrastructure we can rely on is our decentralized model of teaching and learning and blended learning support. So we do have a couple of central centers, as I'm sure you also have at your universities, Center for Teaching and Learning, Center for Quality Assurance, Center for Learning Technologies, but we also have a kind of devolved model. So what we realized is if you look, for instance, at our support contact details page for lectures, you will see for each of our 18 faculties, there is a person that is a blended learning coordinator specifically for that faculty and a Center for Teaching and Learning advisor specifically for that faculty. So these colleagues know the disciplinary context really, really well. They know that labs and practicals are essential um, at the medical campus and they know at social sciences, um, interaction and debate and dialogue is essential for teaching. So they understand that, but they also understand technologies and they also start understand in the cases of the advisors um, how to apply different policies and context to disciplinary fields. So that already helped because when we had that shift, uh, we know we, our lecturers knew there was an actual human that they know and that they probably have a relationship with that they could also rely on. And then obviously, as I mentioned, we have some online teaching and learning experiences. We have rolled out fully online short courses, some of our modules we've repackaged as fully online courses. And um, this is essential if I'm going back to this notion of modes of delivery in our context, because in the emerging market context, as, as many of you also know, um, online means something quite unique. So the reason why we are exploring hybrid learning is not only because we want to look at new knowledge markets and, and expand our um, internationalization strategy. It is also because it's very expensive for our students to come to campus and many of our students need to work um, to earn a living while they study. So we need to allow more flexibility in our context. And with what we've learned for short courses, we've rolled out a, a couple of short courses with more than 100 students and from different African countries over the past couple of years. And we've learned that inter internet connectivity, digital literacies are very diverse in our context. And we need to find um, 
context uh, responsive solutions when you talk about online. And that helps us to understand our, our, our context much better. So that's about just the broad context that we, we, we grappled with. But let's go to the focus of my presentation, which is actually the people, people and processes. So, um, and I, I found that um, my co-presenters also mentioned this, what is the first thing you, you had to put in place? And that is training or professional development of your faculty members or lecturers as we call them. So as I mentioned, the first thing we did two days after our um, on-campus activity was suspended, we launched this uh, webinar series and I'll show more of the other subtopics, but you can see our approach here. Um, more than 110 lecturers attended this session. We have, I think, close to 5,000 RSVPs for our webinar series by now. It's immensely popular, um, but I think it's also because it's very simple. We are cognizant of the fact that we are, this is emergency remote teaching for a contact university. So we are making it clear for universities, we are for uh, lecturers, we are not an e-learning institution, although we have a component of online learning. So we're not trying to, for um, expecting of them to run, run, roll out a fully um, interactive e-learning course with all the bells and whistles, but it has to be pedagogically sound and it has to be high quality. So we focus predominantly on asynchronous or self-paced learning because it allows for different internet uh, capabilities, but it also needs to be interactive as some of my colleagues mentioned. So they needed to simulate an online presence in the, in the, in the virtual space. If it can't be webinars because you have a big cohort of students and some of them don't have high speed internet, you can still record voice notes and audio, you can still record short video clips, and um, you can really add a human presence to the virtual space. And we also made it very clear from the beginning that um, the students will need very holistic support because it's a change for them as well. So quality teaching and learning is not just about the content, it's about the holistic student ex um, experience and that students will need technical academic support, but also peer support. So you need to have those peer discussion channels um, and support groups as well. And you can see from their feedback here, some of the comments as we close one of our, our, our webinars, these are um, colleagues saying they really uh, appreciated and it became almost a learning community, but also su support community for our faculty. And I think this is essential because you need to look at also the holistic faculty experience. They cannot uh, teach a high quality module um, if they don't have holistic support at all. So, a second uh, group of stakeholders uh, that we immediately targeted were our tutors. Uh, tutors play different roles at Stellenbosch University, I'm sure at yours as well. They can be mentors, they can be academic tutors, they can help with assessment, sometimes just checking in with students, but they also know how to navigate the online space. So immediately in a couple of days, we had a, a tutor support site open and they on our Moodle platform, so it was internal and it was scaffold so students or the tutors had to work through all the activities, but they can only get to step three once they completed step two. So it's self-based, but it's mandatory. So we know they understand our principles of good assessment. Somebody mentioned validity, reliability, access. They need to understand um, our student context before they can really start facilitating online. And then once we had that in place, we turned to our students. Now, um, we've learned in South African context that it's key to give the student a voice. We sometimes make ass assumptions about their needs, um, but we rather went to our um, student council chair. Um, you can see him there, Kola Ngele, and he, we asked him to share on his WhatsApp group with uh, other students this notion of you will be going to, uh, learning in a fully online format over the next couple of weeks. What, is, what are your fears? What are your uncertainties? So we used that authentic information. We invited him to our studio. This was just, I think, a day before lockdown. You can see we have a light board there. He was scribbling on it. We edited quickly and created a video which was widely shared on social media. And then this was supplemented with other uh, resources for our students. So uh, examples of those. Oh, my dear. There goes my. There you go. So examples of those resources would be a drawing from what we already had. I mentioned that we did have some online courses. So 
but short courses. So we took those resources, we quickly adapted them and made sure that all students had access to them before they started online learning. Um, we've learned from our, our online teaching experience that it's very jarring for students. We might think that they're, they're uh, digital natives, but to um, suddenly have to engage online can be very uh, challenging for people that if English isn't your first language, uh, it's a very uh, visible way of communicating. It's, it's, a, it's not very private. Um, so uh, online bullying can be a, a behavioral issue. So we started uh, making sensitizing our students to online netiquette. This is one of our resources. I'm happy, happy to share it with the group as well. It's open source. Um, we shared some tips for temporary online learning. We adapted this from our other resources, how to set up your study space, how to set up a calendar so it's self-regulated. Um, and these we found are immensely important. So you really ensure your students, you, because lectures can do everything from their side, but a quality learning is, um, experience requires you to also equip your students for online learning. And then what about um, uh, management, leadership? That's also one of our uh, big uh, stakeholder groups. How did they handle this? Their approach was flexible and adaptable it still is but quite firm you can see from a communique here from uh, our vice director teaching and learning where he says uh, all online uh, teaching material needs to be up by the 20th and then very clearly all lectures need to have a minimum presence on sunlearn which is our lms not this is a clear weekly chronological guidance for the students what to do week by week so breaking it up into manageable chunks and um, they need to have links to support structures they um, need to have low tech low bandwidth options so you cannot just upload an hd 20 minute video of your lecture you also need to compress that or have short clips because we're working with diverse contexts. So you can see this, um, there's still a high standard uh, of the minimum requirements for lecturers. And we set high expectations. This is a recording of one of the webinars, myself and a, a colleague that Frank and some of the other colleagues here know, uh, Marta Barnard, we um, just repeated one of our uh, webinars on the 25th of June. Um, but you can see it's only one of uh, various mandatory minute uh, webinars some of these are webinar uh, mandatory, some of these are optional, but you can see from the topics here, we expect our lecturers to learn how to use online interactive rubrics, how to um, um, facilitate group work in, in the virtual space, how to approach lab practicals and clinical assessments if they're coming from the medical campus. So we do expect them, we know it's a, hard, a steep learning curve and we're putting lots of support in place, but we're also expecting them to come to the, uh, to the, the table. So it's an it's a, it's a interesting manage, uh, balancing act for leaders at this stage. Right, so, um, and the third and final kind of role player responsibility I want to look at is that of communication. And uh, the previous speaker mentioned that as well, essential communication is during this time. And um, the more we have feedback loops at the university where we can learn from another, the uh, the better our chances are of ensuring quality. So the first thing we had in place was institution-wide feedback loops. If you look at our COVID-19 website, every communique and update from the rectorate, from uh, internal, from faculties, um, for our students, for our staff, it's all transparent, it's all uploaded in the same space. So we are, are aware that some students are having challenging um, home environments, they need to come to campus. We know there is a revised leave documentation. Every and other aspect around teaching and learning, but also around the institution is shared. Um, and this helps us to respond quickly to challenges as they come up. But sometimes well, you also- I'm sorry to jump yes. in right now, Mini, but I'm, I'm afraid we're running out of time. So yes. I would need to ask you to, to come to the end, please. Okay, I'll wrap up quickly. Um, I, I'll skip through the communication we had. Um, we had various informal feedback loops as well between lecturers. 
And then finally, I would just like to wrap up with the notion of change. And I think I'll just make this final point. Um, change is, during this period is very uncertain. It's very volatile. It requires transparency about also not just what's going well, but also the, the challenges, the, the technical challenges we're experiencing, what is not working. Um, and it recalls, uh, calls for empathy. So we're so focused on the, the technology, but we also think about your staff well-being, um, notions of self-care for lectures and students. That is also part of quality assurance in our uh, case. And keeping in mind that each university will do it differently. In our case, we have more need for language support in the virtual space because we have 11 languages. So it's okay to also have different responses. But my final slide is really that we need to rather look at than looking for very structured uh, QA interventions. I think this is an opportunity to build a quality culture, which is proactive, it's self-reflective, um, it's sense-making for actions of improvement and it's a part of a self-critical community. So it's very much like we're doing at the moment. We're sharing what's working and not working. So it's less compliance-driven and audit culture and more grappling with the complexity of what we're faced with. And that is, that is the end of my um, presentation. Thank you so much for that, Mimi. And I, I know that the uh, presentation and all the slides will be documented so everybody can have a look at them quite closely afterwards. Thanks to all the presenters for now and I'd like to take up one of the questions that was set for Mine uh, for all of you to have a look at because uh, you all talked about how you gave information to the students. And the question was whether you involved them in the shift, if there was an opportunity for them to give their feedback to several things that you had in mind and wanted to plan. And I'd like to ask you first and then Kiran, Frank and Thomas mm -hmm. to add to that. Uh, yes, uh, student participation is a big part of our quality assurance culture at the university in any case. So we do have built in uh, feedback mechanisms on all our Moodle courses. Uh, but uh, where it was normally quite structured, let's say at the end of the module, midway through a module, we now changed it. So they are um, using uh, questionnaire tools and other tools on, on Moodle. Students can quicker, in a quicker way, give feedback on their online teaching and learning experience and it can be anonymous and, and and then it's shared with multiple stakeholders that can intervene so that's the one way we're doing it the other is I spoke about a kind of non-hierarchical way of sharing information and we have a very big group a subcommittee for this time uh, with multiple stakeholders from IT, from teaching and learning support, but we also have student voices there. So we, so that our deans and vice deans and management are sitting around the same virtual table with our students. So we have immediate feedback from them as well. And I think that's essential to really bring them into to, um, the, the conversation. I'll hand it over to the others to also respond. Kira, would you like to add, please? Yes, okay. For us, what we did was um, several uh, ways. The first was uh, feedback from the students when we did a survey and we involved the student, firstly asking them about the access capabilities. If they have problem accessing the internet and if classes are done online and what are the problems that they would face. So that's how we found students who were at the remote places and who had problems and we, overcome, we overcame that with getting telecommunication companies involved, um, certain private donors involved who also donated uh, computers to the students. And we also advised the lecturers to reduce um, high bandwidth applications. And uh, the second, yes, on our Moodle, the LMS system spectrum, they call it, uh, students can give feedback as usual. It is at the end of the semester. But under the quality management center itself, we also have an e-feedback mechanism where the students at any time can, uh, can log in and give us feedback on what is going on. And uh, finally, uh, another example was, I think, the one that I mentioned earlier about the uh, grading criteria where students were actively involved, whether they wanted the university to 
move on to grading just a pass or fail or stay stick with the current grading system. And the feedback that we got from the student were they were comfortable with the current grading system. They did not want pass to pass or fail. I suppose they assumed that once they go into the industry, they did not want that on their transcript. They rather have a grade. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'd like to hand on to the University College for Teacher Education in Vienna. How did you handle that? Uh, well, it depends. Of course, we had certain kind of feedback mechanisms. That means institutionalized uh, feedback forms that need to be filled in in order to like provide data for our responsible ministry. But for us in the distance learning scenarios, uh, one of the most important things was also like the direct synchronous uh, interaction with the students, uh, especially when it comes to professional development and also like ways to improve the distance learning, the distance learning experience. We are well aware of the fact that we can't do this with every single student. But what we know from uh, research data from the University of Vienna is that one of the most crucial lacks of blended or distance learning is the interaction, interactional patterns, also like giving, providing feedback. So what we do seen uh, from the performance of students is that we also give audio feedback on all the artifacts. So that means also like all the, the, the tasks and master thesis that are uploaded on the learning management systems are being video feedback and audio feedback because we want to increase at least a so-called discursive proximity, sometimes getting away of standardized, automized feedback scenarios. This is one approach, Klaus. And uh, what students really appreciated um, was that our teachers were free to choose how the distance learning concept looks like. So they can mix up uh, synchronous sessions via Zoom with, with other elements. And the students really appreciated uh, lessons uh, with Zoom, that they have the contact, that they can communicate and collaborate, that they get immediate feedback uh, by the teacher. And those teachers who invested a lot in these online sessions, they really got good evaluation. Thank you. And I'd like to add just uh, a question concerning the topic that you have spoken about now. And uh, our audience also is concerned with the role of teachers in this shift and uh, about the change in the mind shift that was uh, uh, mentioned here. And we talked a lot about the interaction between students and teachers and the university to teachers and the university to students, but how did interaction and communication between the teachers themselves work during the change? Did they have any opportunity of discussing what they did, of discussing their didactics and how they handled the situation? Maybe we would go the other way around now and start with uh, the colleagues from Vienna. How did you do that? Um, a, very, a very interesting um, experience was that one of our teachers um, who usually only does uh, lectures in the, in the lecture hall, uh, was very surprised that the amount of students who participated in this online lecture uh, was rising up uh, three times higher. So he, he was surprised that he has um, more students in the, in the classroom online than in the lecture hall. And um, following your, your question, uh, I think that it was um, at the very beginning, very important that the teachers meet the students online and together um, create a, a common concept for, for the lesson for this period. And I think many of our teachers uh, did online lessons for the first time and only had our support and our uh, trainings and, and tutorials, and they, they really um, invested a lot to, uh, to be able to do the first online lessons. 
And I just would like to quickly add, so there have been certain informal exchange sessions uh, among teachers. And I really have to say at our university college, uh, the majority really is willing to design such uh, learning environments. But the thing is what we see here, there's a lot of uh, discursive stereotypes going on when it comes to the implementation of learning, uh, distance learning scenarios, because a lot of our uh, professors and lecturers still believe that it's all related to a certain kind of technological determinism in order to implement solid, coherent uh, distance learning scenarios. And that's our main focus concerning the shift to digital learning that we want to encompass our lecturers, that they get the skills of didactic taxonomies and designs that they don't have to be IT experts in order to come up with solid uh, learning uh, scenarios and blended learning scenarios. Thank you. Kiran, how about your university? How did the teachers communicate among themselves? Okay, at uh, our university, uh, several channels were being used. Uh, in the beginning, we introduced uh, Telegram, right? Uh, there was a group created on Telegram called the UM Online Teaching. So a lot of issues were being put up on that and being shared, especially by the Academic Development uh, Center. They're in charge of training the lecturers. So a lot of communication through that. Uh, secondly, webinars. There were online webinars continuously being conducted internally just within UM, where people could share their experiences. And we also had another a WhatsApp group with our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academic and Internationalization, where the four entities that I mentioned before, uh, the quality management system, the academic enhancement, we communicated directly with the Deputy Vice Chancellor on issues that we were hearing from the ground. So there were several channels and right up to, she, she is always on the know of what is happening. So because decision-making comes from the uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor. Yeah. Thank you. Mine, how about your situation among the teachers? Right, so um, as I mentioned, I showed a couple of screenshots of the, the webinars also at, at our university. And what we started to do after uh, about the first month of presenting these webinars is we, and I saw in the chat, somebody also asked about how to draw uh, lectures voice really into this conversation. So we asked them to start being our co-presenters. So we, um, so they can start sharing lessons learned and best practice as well um, to really draw from their voice and to also ask them to, to share um, advice with other lecturers. And we do find that obviously academics want to hear from ac other academics in their discipline, in their field. So they started setting up their own chat groups um, and sharing best practices that way. So I think um, for us, uh, any academic support staff, it's it's absolutely essential to provide the, the voice and the platform for, for lecturers themselves um, and allow that in a very structured way, such through, through webinars and resources, but also set up those informal feedback channels, um, teams or WhatsApp groups, whatever it is, um, so we can learn from one another and incentivize that. So um, we have a teaching excellence awards, by, for example, at the university, and we are drawing in um, how people are responding to, to the pandemic period to really highlight and applaud that as well. Thank you. And I have to look at the watch and I see that we have already been nibbling into the time for the coffee break. So I'd like to thank all the people in the audience for their patience with us. But I think the presentations and the Q&A session has given everybody lots of food for thought. When they return for the workshops, they will have lots of things to talk about. And I'd also like to mention that if you, as the audience, click at, on the Q&A button, you will see that some of the questions that were put there have already been answered online. So not everything that you wrote is lost. We all document it. And there have already been answers to some of the issues. So you can check there if you're missing some topics that you were especially keen on. And now it's my pleasure to thank you all for contributing to our online conference. Thanks a lot thank for you. that. Thanks for the questions and enjoy the rest of the forum, please. Take Bye -bye. care. All the best. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.
Um, hello, everyone. I would like to thank you all for participating in today's plenary. It was great to have you here with us. And now we're going to have the workshop on challenges and good practices in quality assurance, starting at 3.45 p.m. Bangkok, Jakarta time. If you have registered for the workshop as well, you can find the link in your email where you can join us. The next ASEAN Q&A Forum Series 2 will be at the end of August on the topic, Going Digital, Learning from the Learners. And the date of the forum and more details about registration will be announced to your email. We hope to see you again next month. Thank you all for joining us once again.